and surely they were the aggressors. Jesus, for some unknown reason, just leaned against the ropes and absorbed the blows. Rope a dope. The bell rang and Jesus just walked to his corner, sat on the stool. He definitely did not look like he did in the first two rounds. The blow he took when Judas sought the opportunity to hand him over really struck him good. Jesus and his Mateos, the disciples, the Hagios, the holy community, are in the upper room about to celebrate the Passover. Yes. They all sat down, which is not actually how they ate. They laid down on their sides and ate. And as they were eating, Jesus says to them in verse 21, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now this is the beginning of round four. And Jesus has just hit Judas with a strong uppercut. His head almost left his body from the power of the punch. Much like Mike Tyson used to throw uppercuts. Can't you hear Judas saying, he knows about my plot with the Jewish leaders. This Last Supper has now become very interesting and tense. Everyone is sorrowful and begin to question, is it I? Yes. Jesus tells them plainly in verse 23, the same who's dipping in the dish with me shall betray me. Yes. Everyone at the table missed it but Judas. Yes. How dull do you have to be of understanding when Jesus says the one who's going to betray me is the same one taking the, the Doritos and <laughs> dipping it in the bean dip. <laughs> Nobody called mm -hmm. it with Judas. Jesus hit the Jewish leaders through Judah, Judas with a strong right hand jab. And then in verse 25, Judas asked Jesus plainly, is it I? Oh, what a Come on. asinine question. You know what you've done, Judas, and you have the audacity, the unmitigating God, to ask, is it I? And Jesus replied, thou hast said. <laughs> Jesus, with their reply, hits Judas and the Jewish leaders yes, yes. with a hard combination, a left to the body and a right to the jaw. Judas' knees buckle. He almost goes down. The crowds are standing to their feet. The bell rings, ending the round. Jesus won that round. Round four is a wrap. Jesus' the disciples Eat the Last Supper. Take, eat, this is my body. I'm the Paschal Lamb. Mm. I'm the sacrifice. It had never been said like that before. Yeah. Drink the wine, which is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. Yeah. Yeah. Without the shedding of the blood, yeah. there's no remission of sins. Yes. There was one more element Jesus dealt with that Matthew didn't, do, didn't deal with. And that's in the book of John. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Wow. He just rose. Because uh, he has nothing to hide. Wow. He's transparent. And he begins to wash their feet. Now this was a custom in, in Israel, among the Jews, that when guests would enter your house, right. you would wash their feet. If you had the money, you didn't wash the feet. The servants yeah. washed the guests' feet. Right. And every now and then, if the, guest, if, the, if the owner of the house did not have a lot of money, uh -huh. didn't have a servant, yeah. every now and then, they would wash your feet. Yeah. But a lot of times, they would let the guests wash their own feet. But Jesus washes all of their feet. Welcome them into the house. Herein lies a problem. Jesus says, 
Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nets. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So my, my, my question is because Jesus is borrowing the upper room. Why are you washing their feet? You, you have no home to welcome them into. But he did tell us, I go and prepare a place for you. Yes, so in other words, he was welcoming all 12 into him, yes, even Jews. My God. Man, well, well, that, that messes me up, Ms. Angela. That, that messes me up, Reverend Finney. That messes me up, Mr. Drake, because I can see washing Peter's feet. Uh -huh. I can see washing Thomas' feet. Yeah. He has a problem with faith, but at least he's not a backstab. Uh -huh. I, I, I can see some of the other disciples, but you mean to tell me I'm going to wash Judas' feet? That's it. Help us, Holy Ghost. Yes, he welcomes him into heaven. Mm. Although he knows he stabbed him in the back. Lord Jesus. I want to ask you a question tonight. Mm. How do you treat your backstabbers? Mm. How do you treat those who you know have mistreated you and set you up? Have you looked at your feet? I've looked at mine. Lord, have you looked at the dirt trail? Have, have, have you taken knowledge and been cognizant of where your feet have been? Uh -huh. Because whenever you wash somebody's feet, yes. you would recognize they've been on this trail, they've been on that trail, uh -huh. because different trails had different types of dirt. My God. My God. So Jesus in washing their feet is also a telltale sign of where they've been. Would you wash your Judas' feet? Because in the washing of the feet, you were refreshing them. Because your feet walked around in sandals all day. And your feet get all dirty. And you know they wore those sandals that was wide open. And all that dirt would get under your toes. And, and Jesus had the audacity to deal with their toe jam. And I'm so glad. I don't know about you. But, but I'm so glad God deals, I can't say it, deals with the messy places in our lives. He, he deals with things that other folks would talk about us about. And that there are some things in my past that I pray, Lord, don't ever let them come up. And that, that's why I try not to talk about people. Because I don't want the skeleton bones in my closet to start talking. I wish I had help. I can't throw a rock at nobody because I live in a glass house. Amen. Jesus takes the time. And, and you know how you ladies are, and, 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 and some of us as men, uh -huh. we, we like to go and get our feet did. That's right. Amen. I, I know that doesn't sound good. I know I know it's foot, but we like to go, Miss Angela, get our, get our feet did. We, we like to have the bubbles in the water. That's right. And, and we like somebody to pull up with a mask on and make gloves and we like somebody to pet them around with our toes. It just feels good getting your feet dead. Right. Could you imagine doing that for your greatest enemy? Giving them a refreshing. Mm. When you know good well, this person has set you up for death. Jesus is no respecter of persons. Amen. He made no difference. I don't know about you, Reverend Finney, but y'all pray for me. Yes, Lord. If I just saw a corn, I may have hit it just a little harder than it's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the little tool, I don't even know what they call it, Mr. Drake, but they go around the cuticle. I kind I, I, I of had him in the, in the chair jumping. <laughs> but Jesus treated him just as lovingly uh -huh. as he treated his other disciples. We can learn something there. Because so often we treat those who treat us right real good. Uh -huh. But those who don't treat us right, many times we don't treat them like Christ bids us to. All right. Judas gets the best seat at the table. Scholars will tell you when you study it. Judas had the best seat or the best reclining position, because they reclined in age. He's got the best seat, and if that makes sense, give that scoundrel the worst seat. I'm telling you, amen, amen, amen. He gave him the best seat. 
treat your enemy better than you treat your best friend. And it takes God to do that. It takes a prayer life. Because every morning our flesh gets up. I don't know about y'all, but James, James gets up. And sometimes I find myself getting up on the wrong side of the bed. And I literally got to get back in the bed in my mind and make sure I get up on the right side. Help me, Holy Ghost. But Jesus treats his enemy better than he treats his friends. Man, we can learn something right there. And that's how Jesus would have us to be. Love your enemies. And what does that mean? That doesn't just mean when I love you. That means do well by them. Treat them like you treat your mother. Yeah. Oh, treat them like you would treat your father. Yeah. Treat them like you would treat your brother or sister. Yeah. Somebody ought to just lift their hand and say, Lord, help me, right help, us, help me right there. Help us, Jesus, <laughs> to be more like you. Yes, Lord. Give them the best spot. Reverend Finney can get his hands on ourselves looking at everybody else. Lord, he had the best spot. He was dipping out the sweet potatoes, if you let me use my imagination. I'm waiting on the bowl to be passed, and this scoundrel is eating first. I had, I had the best piece of pound cake, y'all ain't saying nothing. If you like me, when birthday cakes come out, I like to get the corners. Because the corner of the cake got icing almost all the way around it. Y'all ain't saying that. The other pieces ain't got a little bit at the top. But see, when you're greedy, you try to analyze how can I get more. <laughs> Jesus yeah. gives him the best, yes, not the least. Yeah. Can I preach it like I feel it? Yeah. Usually, if we're not careful, oh, we give our enemies the least uh. and give our friends the best. But Jesus don't do it that way. He gives his enemy the best and give his friends even least or the lesser. He's teaching us something. This man's about to get me killed, but I'm still going to love him. He got VIP treatment. Have a seat, right? Come, come, come. Come, my friend, come. He got the dirt on his feet from hanging out with the Jewish leaders, and Jesus treats him good. Yeah. And my girl, Sade, you know, Sade, the gospel according to Sade, huh. this is no ordinary love. <laughs> Jesus knew Judas had stabbed him in the back, <laughs> knew he was a turncoat. Yeah. Knew he was, as the young folk would say, employing their verbiage. He was fake. My God. Jesus teaches us how to treat our neighbors. Yes, yes. But he also teaches us something else. He just tells him, go and do what you're going to do quickly. Because Jesus shows us when a person's mind is evil, and bent on doing something, right. you can't talk them out of it. Right. He said, just go do what you're going to do. But we also learn another principle. Oh, when a person mistreats someone who has not done anything to them, they hang themselves. Come on, just read the Bible, you'll find out what I'm talking about. We'll talk about it in a few more days. Whenever you and I or anyone mistreats us mm. for no reason at all, if we don't repent, we end up hanging our own selves. Yes. Bringing me to the end of round five. Lord, round five, uh -huh. Jesus, he wins. Huh. He hit him. He didn't know what to do. Right His knees wobbled. Lord, <laughs> he, he, he didn't know that Jesus knew. You know, it's something when you set somebody up and you think they don't know. Uh -huh. But it's another thing when they confront you uh -huh. and let you know, I know what you did. Yes. And I want you to know I know what you did. And so that brings me to my, my first point. Pray with me. Yes. First point, pray with me. Comes the 
Garden of Gethsemane to undo what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. The olive berry press is there. Big slab, big stone. It was tilted. I can't tell you which way, but it was tilted. So that when the stone would run over it, the olive berries would crush, the oil would run out. And the first pressing, as we heard a preacher say during Lenten prayer service, the first pressing was the extra virgin olive oil. That's the oil that's, the oil that's costly and most pure. Yeah. But then they would keep running over it and get all the oil out of it, it would fall into a vat. It was the place of crushing. Jesus knew, could you imagine walking in and you see the olive press and now you know I'm about to die and you understand I'm about to be crushed. And, and, and in my crushing, the blood is going to run out and it's going to give remission of sins for all of humanity. The crushing is what produces the all. And a lot of times people wonder, why am I going through what I'm going through? Sometimes God has to crush us. And I don't mean it in an ugly way. He's not trying to kill us. But he's trying to get out of us what he knows is in us. Yeah. And sometimes the only way it shows up is that we are crushed. Lord Jesus. Jesus takes three with him. He has 11. Judas is gone. He's gone to talk to religious leaders. But there's 11 left. He leaves eight at the entrance. And he takes three with him. Huh. Peter, James, and John. James and John are his cousins. Takes Peter. And Jesus begins to be sorrowful. He knows what this crushing is going to entail. Suffering, pain, and a crucifixion. He asked the inner circle to pray with him. Jesus went a little further and he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, thine will be done. Comes back to the inner circle, and they are asleep. And if you ask me why they sleep, I'll tell you why. Because it ain't they cross. A lot of times we ask people to pray for us. And they say, I'm going to pray, but they ain't going to pray like you're going to pray. That's right. Because it ain't their cross. Uh -huh. Now, when it's their cross, oh, they're going to pray. Uh -huh. Father, we need you right now. <laughs> Father, we need you. Help me, God. Oh, they'll pray then. But when it's your cross, yeah. they get sleepy. Mm. The disciples are sleeping. And ain't they cross? It's not their day. Jesus goes on praise again. He's praying. Come back. They sleep. He prays, Oh, my Father, this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it. Thy will be done. And I just want you to look at somebody. Don't touch them. But just tell them, sometimes you got to drink what you don't want to drink. Sometimes God will ask you to do some things you and I really don't want to do. And, and not all the time does praying change things. I, I know we say that it sounds good. I mean, I like the concept. But prayer don't always change things. Most times prayer changes us. To accept God's holy will. A lot of times, a lot of times people feel like prayer is something they can use to get their way. But a lot of times it don't work like that in the I pray and God don't turn it around and eventually I have to go through it. I'll give you my perfect example. Hurricane Harvey was on the way. I had on my shorts and my shirt and I said I'm going to go out and do like Elijah. It shall not rain. It shall not rain. And it shall not flood. The water was all up to my knees. I'm going to say, it shall not rain. It shall not flood. Water kept rising down to my thighs. I went back out there. It shall not get in my house. I walked back in the house. My wife said, guess what? The water's in the house. I said, it shall not overtake us. She said, James, pack up your stuff. Because we 
got to realize crap don't always change things. If it's God's will, you and I can't stop it. But prayer helps us to get a mindset to accept God's will. Amen. In a manner to change God's will. Prayer is supposed to yes. bring me to a mindset yes. to where I, not my will, but thine will be done. I'm not saying don't pray. That's right. But what I am saying, don't get mad when it's not answered in the manner that we thought it would. Right. I'm telling you, I'm glad that one. Folks are looking at me. <laughs> Forgive them. Do we hold grudges? Do we get back at them? 
How do you and I treat our neighbors in light of tonight's lesson? Father, we praise you. 